We're joined in the studio by Terry McMahon, the writer and director of uh, Charlie Casanova. We're going to have a short clip from Charlie Casanova and then we're going to come back to the studio where I'll interview Terry and we'll have a bit of crack. Life is short and I want to play a game bigger than poker. My name is Charlie Barnum and if there is a god this may very well be my last will and testament. Think of the innumerable things you privately yearn to do. But law, morality, conservatism, wives, children, parents, even strangers tell you every day that you cannot do those things. Yeah. What happens if we give you the complete right to abdicate all responsibility? Oh, what happens if you tempt fate to find out if this is what you should really be doing with your life, if this is who you should really be? Now that's, that's power. You pose a question to yourself, a question that you are afraid to even consider. Something that pushes you out of your comfort zone, something that at least changes your day, or better still, your life. You have to pose a question in such a way that you can only get a yes or no well, answer. Kind of Just one question. Are we men? Are we? Here's the five yes, six and ten. No, 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 no. Something needs be anything you want, but you have to be brave, you have to push it, and you have to abide by the answer of the card. Six to ten. You hear me? <laughs> you hear me? You don't know what I'm capable of! You don't know me! You don't know me! You don't know me! You hear me? You don't know me! You don't know me! We're joined in the studio by Terry McMahon, the writer and director of uh, Charlie Casanova. Thanks very much for coming into Dole TV. Pleasure, man. What do you think of our set? Love it. Love the whole setup. Gorgeous, isn't it? More TV should be like this. That's it. So, Charlie Casanova, um, it's out on the 11th of May in Ireland on general release, release is it, yeah? And the UK. And the UK. In all cinemas? Uh, I think about 20 in Ireland and about 40 in England. So this is, uh, the film is an extraordinary story, but the story behind the film is an extraordinary, extraordinary story as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, on the simplest level, <coughs> I had three screenplays greenlit by the film board, the Irish film board. And each of those films had 750,000 euros put on the table. And that's a hugely exciting process and a hugely exciting position to be in, but suddenly they didn't get made. Mm -hmm. And you go from being massively excited to going, <coughs> this is nonsense. <coughs> so eventually you find yourself in a position where you're going, why was I doing this in the first place? What did I want to get involved in film for in the first place? And I wanted to make visceral cinema. I wanted to make politically driven visceral cinema. And For me, what does visceral mean? The idea of it hits you right here. Why? Yeah. Bang. And it doesn't have to be something that you can comprehend up here. It can be something you find distasteful up here, but that sense of your stomach going, there's something very fucking dodgy going on here. I don't know why, but I can't stop watching it. Yeah, not like a kick in the bollocks, but like a wake up kind of, that kind of thing? The kick in the bollocks is a good description, but I think the kick in the bollocks is something that is slow, initial pain and then slow, like austerity, yeah. whereas visceral is, this is happening now, and right here in front of us now, and I don't know how to respond to it. And I used to find that in English cinema, and some American cinema, but I very rarely ever found it in Irish cinema. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make, or I wanted to make a film and write a script that was born out of that desire. And I wrote a script called Charlie Casanova. And the tagline for Charlie Casanova is, you don't know him, but he already hates you. And straight away, you're talking about a, a commercial nightmare, commercial suicide. But I still felt that I could write a central character that represented everything I found disgusting and abhorrent about the kind of characteristics that have become our leaders in this country and our politically driven liars in this country. Mm -hmm. I wrote the script and uh, sent it to the film board, and the film board hated it. Yeah. Now this is the same film board who had been very, very generous to my other script, so it wasn't personal, but they just hated it. And why didn't the other ones get made? Uh, again, producers couldn't get the matching finance. Yeah. This happens a lot. Films get greenlit a lot and then fall apart. But the idea here behind Charlie was to see if we could supersede the need for money, which is naive beyond fucking belief, but the impossibility of it became part of his drive. When the film board rejected the script, I arranged a reading for them in the new theatre around the corner here. My, Good friend of mine, Anthony Fox, runs it. Mm -hmm. We had a great cast in place. Uh, I originally wrote the script for Declan Conlon. We had Catherine Walker, we had Joe Hanley, we had David Pierce, we had Joan Crawford, we had Una Kavanaugh, we had a brilliant cast. We put the reading on for the film board and they hated the fucking script even more. So you had all the guys around there, the whole thing set up. Yeah. They went through like everything and just, we don't get yeah. it, we hate it. So what's interesting about that is that it teaches you the principle of 
why you're doing what you're doing and why are we standing there with our hand out looking for permission to make material? Why are we looking for financial authorization and by extension aesthetic authorization to make the kind of work we want to make? So I went away and thought, okay, I have to find some way of making this film, mm -hmm. even if nobody ever sees it. Now, I wanted it to be for an audience, but I also wanted it to be uncompromised. So RT were briefly a part of it. They read the script and they rejected it as well. Hated it too. So eventually you go, okay, we have two functionary bodies in this country that are there to facilitate cultural engagement and arts. Both of them hate the film. Is that reason enough not to make it? No, it's fucking not. Yeah. So I put an ad on Facebook and I was new to Facebook and I didn't fully understand. Was how it a drunken ad now? It was, there was a few whiskeys involved. Yeah. <laughs> okay. After surfing porn for a few hours. But eventually you get to the point where you're going, right, why am I doing this? And I got a tattoo put on my body. It just says, the art is in the completion, begin. I don't know whether you can see that on each camera. But again, it probably sounds like pretentious bullshit to some people. But for me, it was very important that I write something on your body where it's a constant reminder of why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I was a writer for Fair City. I wrote over 100 episodes of Fair City. So not a fan. Not a fan myself. It's, 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 uh, we won't go into why. And it's, yeah why it's so many different things, but actually we will, fuck it. It's, a, it. it's appallingly, appallingly <coughs> dis disrespectful and patronizing to the working class in itself. And it's one of the reasons, not to take it off point, it's one of the mm. reasons why we make Doll TV, mm. is because we're sick of what we see. Yeah, yeah. And we don't have a budget, we just mm. knock it out, like, mm. because we're excited by what we do, we have mm. imaginations, we have creativity. Mm. And that's, that's why I'm excited to interview you, because you seem like a similar kind of entity, mm. you know? Mm. You have balls, you have ideas, you have mates, let's just go and do it. Mm. Well, that, even that principle there, what you're talking about, that's by virtue of necessity, that became who we were. But we shouldn't have to be doing that out of necessity. We should be a, a multicultural, cross-cultural engagement. But we don't have that in this country. We have a mm -hmm. tiny elite group of people who define everything and decide everything in the arts and culture and everything. And we're yes or no, so can we get, yeah. us, can we get, can we get a scraping off your plate? So with something like Fair City, um, um, there was, f and I'm not just saying this, there were fantastic people working on that show, as actors, as uh, staff in the office, as crew, as everything. The producer, John Lynch, was a magnificent man. The next producer, Niall uh, Matthews, was a magnificent man. Script editor, Kevin McHugh. Magnificent people, like genuinely magnificent people. So it's not that anybody is intentionally defining a separate notion of the working class. But if you see it in Fair City, nobody lives in a, in a council flat. Nobody mm -hmm. lives in a block of flats. They don't exist. Although half the cast come from Ballymun now. Exactly. But the point is that even, even those cast, it's like the rubber stamp approved. It's like as long as, and this is in our cinema as well, not just mm -hmm. our television, but as long as the working class are either there for comic effect or some uh, threat, then it's fine. Yeah. And that's all the, that's the reductionist notion. That's There's a great really article in Rabble, was one of the, like mm -hmm. the locally produced free magazines, and it's about that working class accent mm -hmm. being used as either a piss take or mm -hmm. you're a gangster or yeah. something like yeah. that, you know, which sickens me. Yeah, you ha by virtue of your accent and your haircut, you're scum mm -hmm. or you're, you're a clown. That's all you are. The idea of engaging on any level uh, with, uh, again, a cross-cultural intelligence is, has been wiped from every agenda straight away. But you've made this film now, and you've got tons of iftas. That, something has well, shifted there. We've got tons of iftas nominations and no nominations, iftas. Okay. But again, and this is with respect to the iftas, it was very, very brave of them to have the balls to even uh, nominate us. But nobody was going to let me on the stage, so we didn't win anything. But because of the iftas, I think there are 1.146 million people. That was their figure. That's the amount of people in this country who watched that award show, which is staggering. What a number. So those people, some of them in Middle Ireland, some of them wherever, have heard of Charlie Casanova for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now what happened with Charlie Casanova, we ended up making the film anyway, just to, to, to contextualize it. We made the film, I put the ad on Facebook and it said very simply, intend making no budget feature Charlie Casanova. Need cast, crew, equipment and a lot of balls. Any takers, script at www.terrymcmahon.com or .org. Uh, this is sincere, so bullshit is fuck off in advance. I'm bullying, I missed that, because I would have loved to be in the play the film. Anyway, the next one. Well, it's, it, but it's, it, the ad is still, not the ad, but the status is still there, because my yeah. page is open and I've left everything open, the whole journey of it. But I felt like a fucking idiot. I was embarrassed, I was sitting there, my kids and missus were asleep. It was coming close to Christmas. I hated my job and uh, I was about to lose it. I got fucking shafted during Charlie Casanova, which makes a kind of sense. And suddenly you're sitting there, you got a cheap whiskey in front of you, it's three o'clock in the morning, you can't sleep, you got a new tattoo in your body that's burning you and you're going, what am I gonna do? I typed in those words and I was so fucking embarrassed. I was about to delete it. Mm -hmm. And as I was about to delete it, a status popped up and then another one and then another one. And within 24 hours, 130 people got back to me. And the one stipulation was you had to read the screenplay in advance. 
because the screenplay had been so roundly rejected. Yeah, yeah. And uh, remarkably, people really got the screenplay. Did you make it in January in, in, in 2010, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? Was the, it the mental snow? The mental crazy snow. Uh, we had so many, and again, it's funny because we had, one thing that you experience, and you must experience this with Dole TV all the time, uh, you're never surprised at the amount of rejection you receive, mm -hmm. but I'm constantly surprised and elevated by the amount of fucking surprising generosity you receive. Extraordinary generosity from sources you never thought possible. And we shot the film in 11 days, and uh, then the, sent the film into the film board, and the film board hated it. So then you're in a position where you're going, hold on a second, they're out to make a decision based on their taste as opposed to based on facilitating cultural remit for Irish cinema, which kind of bothered me, mm -hmm. but there's nothing I could do. Then we sent it to several festivals. Sorry, just to clarify, Tony Kearns came in and edited it for us, and then Wynne Mullane did massive post-production for us for free. Yeah, so you're talking about a, a budget for a film that cost 937 euros in real terms. I'd lost my job, I was fucked, I needed cash, I needed to put food on the table, I literally couldn't afford to put food on the table. But there was a part of me thinking, just there is something in this film, there is a kernel of truth in this film that not everybody is going to get, a lot of people are going to despise, but it's also going to hit some people. And I remember watching uh, videos at the time, weren't DVDs, but I remember watching videos. I used to live in a bed set, a series of bed sets, but I remember sitting in a bed set watching films alone. And when you see a film that, again, that visceral impact, mm -hmm. where it hits you like that, and you want to turn to speak to somebody, but there's nobody there, but that film just gets to you in that way. Some kind of emotion or whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, want, I was looking for that in the film, and I, I hoped some people would get it. And then South by Southwest Film Festival in Texas, one of the biggest film festivals in the world. Which is huge, but like, mm. like yourself, I, I didn't know much about it, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm involved uh, it, it, with music, with rappers mm. and all this type of mm. stuff, and that's the place that they're telling us to go to, yeah. to put your stuff in there. Absolutely. Like. But it's funny because in my ignorance, I knew fuck all about it. But when I checked it out, I realized that, like, I'll give you an example of its stature. Bruce Springsteen gave the keynote speech there this year. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of people they attract. Uh, Janet Pearson, who's the head of South by Southwest, she sent an email, the kind of email that you fantasize about, saying it was one of the best films she's ever seen, one of the best directorial debuts she'd ever seen, one of the greatest screenplays, one of the greatest central performances, so on and so forth. And they said, we want to invite it for its world premiere in competition at South by Southwest. And no Irish film has ever been selected for competition there. And suddenly you're in a position where the world's media want a piece of you. Variety are writing about you, they're writing about you in New York, in Los Angeles, this unknown film from this unknown filmmaker. And things are going to change. Things are going to have a profound change. The opposite happened. Nobody gave a fuck. Yeah. So again, a little insular Ireland in its little protected little world. Fuck you, who do you think you are? Go over to Texas. We arrived in Texas and the whisper was we were going to win the grand jury prize. Janet Pearson, who was one of the most remarkable, in, t in historical terms, in terms of American independent cinema, the people she's been behind is astonishing. Mm -hmm. She stood on stage in America and said, my favorite film used to be Michael Lee's Naked, but now my favorite film is Terry McMahon's Charlie Casanova. And she said this in front of the world's press. And this, the, the sense of, of something extraordinary happening was in the air. And then suddenly, bang, we didn't win anything. Variety gave us the worst review imaginable. And suddenly, bang, you're dead. You're yeah. dead again all over again. <clears throat> and then you go, right, how do we deal with this? So you go straight up and then, yeah. you know. And Charlie has been that journey all along. So yeah. next morning, get up, we went back to the hotel, we got drunk, we got a bit fucking high, and we just sat there and went, what, ne what needs to be done next? I was up at half four in the morning, it was on ABC television. And it was St. Patrick's Day. And the woman was sitting there, and it was live television. And she sat there and she went, top of the morning to you. Oh yeah, nice one, thanks. And you're sitting there Patronize me again. So I said to her, look, normally I'd be proud to be Irish, but I've never been more ashamed to be Irish. And I started describing what the government is doing to its people and how the decimation of the working class has become government policy. And she's sitting there, and you can see the colour draining from her Happy face. Happy St. Patrick's Day. This was supposed to be a jaunty little fucking ride. Yeah. And then she says, OK, you have a film in the festival. Tell us about the film. And I says, well, we were reviewed in Variety last night. And I turned to the camera, and I quoted the review word for word. And then I said, but fuck Variety. Sometimes you have to realise we're not making movies for Variety all the I time. I haven't seen that interview. I'd love to see that one. <laughs> it was live, so it wasn't oh, recorded. Really but... Uh, she fucking, she went purple. You could see the guys behind the camera looking the whole lot. But what it did was it threw a gauntlet down again. It threw a bomb down. So I left the studio then, was brought back to, to um, the festival. And suddenly people were coming up saying, I've been wanting to say fuck variety for a decade. All that kind of stuff. And you go, it's back to the fight. The film is about the fight. So we've had astonishing successes. We've had standing ovations and we've had literally walkouts. Yeah. We've had 
ugly reviews beyond measure and we've had startling reviews. We won Best First Feature on Galway, we, all these kind of things. We won festivals in uh, America, in Paris. It's extraordinary how, how the people who get behind the film get behind it for the same seed I was talking about, that kernel of viscerality that we talked about. Yeah. And those who reject it just fucking despise it. So we just got reviews last night from London and uh, they are some of the worst reviews imaginable. Deadly, can't wait. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? There's, the, there's an energy created by that, by mm. the down. There has to be some kind yeah. of up. And I've learned that through, through doing stand up. And for mm. you, it's about managing mm. managing that. So, are you cracking a few quid out of this? Because no, not we're doing doll, doll TV for nothing. Like, I'm broke and I'm not crying poverty. Mm. I'm excited about doing this type of stuff. But are you getting a living out of it? Or? No, not at all. It's funny because back to talking about doll TV, the idea. And it's not, I, I don't believe, for example, that we all got greedy during the so-called Celtic Tiger and that somehow we got to pay it back. People use the word greed now as a description of the working class. Yeah. The people who wanted a better car and wanted a home and wanted a little bit, little bit of a life were greedy all of a sudden. When we're giving awards to entrepreneurs and businessmen who own fucking half the city, but somehow they're not greedy and we were, we became greedy. It's just but, such a fallacy. But it's the, those guys, which I call the ruling class, who are, mm. they're spouting the greedy, greedy, greedy. You know what I mean? Exactly. But that's a, it's funny, that great <coughs> expression, the ruling class. The, the uh, synopsis, or the, uh, the description of Charlie, the movie, is that a ruling class sociopath knocks down a working class girl on a hit and run. And instead of trying to do something about it, he uses a deck of playing cards to determine that's, his fate. That's his system. Yes. You know what I mean? So yes. is that how you see the ruling class? Well, of course it is. But by, by virtue of necessity, firstly, the cards are the free market. Secondly, the idea of culpability. You have two choices. You either accept responsibility for who you are or you look for someone to blame. And we are now the ones who are being blamed. And we are the ones who are being attacked. And this part, it literally has become government policy. And you find any situation in this country where anybody is deemed to be culpable for the most obscene things imaginable, it doesn't exist. But if somebody has the wrong action or the wrong address, they'd be in prison in a heartbeat. Oh, here, don't get me started on this central court up here. It's yeah. it like a, a, a money-making system. You yeah. know, process working class people yes, through it. And absolutely. barristers and solicitors or whatever, yeah. making books off. What a disgusting scam. You, you say something about Mary Harney. Anything at all about Mary Harney. Something was said on the radio, and suddenly the station was sued. Tom Dunn had to give the most groveling apology imaginable. Mm -hmm. And Mary Harney won 450,000 euros. That's just because someone suggested that she might have a problem with drink. You open a Sunday world any day, you got some guy who's in a tracksuit and the wrong haircut and the wrong accent. They can call him scum, they can call him king rat, they can call him anything they want. They can accuse him of anything and there's no comeback. But yet Mary Harney, because she's a member of the ruling class, suddenly the whole law steps in to protect her. Yeah. It's a scam, it's a dreadful, dreadful scam. And Charlie Casanova is about that reality. And the whole function of the film is posing the question, how much more are you going to accept? How much more are you going to take before you step up and fucking do something? And it's like you done that with the film boards. But what, what I'm thinking in my head is, just why didn't they go for it? Why didn't they get it? Why didn't, you know? Again, it's not personal. And I'm, and I'm not trying to uh, double bluff here or hedge my bets, because I've said things about the film board multiple times, and there's no need to go over it again. But it's, they are good people who are trying to do their notion of a good thing. And their notion of a good thing is based on a very limited commercial idea of what cinema is. Mm -hmm. A very limited cultural idea of what Ireland is. Profoundly limited. As opposed to an all-engaged notion of going, I don't fully understand this, but Christ, there's something in there that is distinctively original and is a singular vision. That singular vision is something that frightens them rather than engages them. Yeah. And I can understand it. Um, so, did this, you sound frustrated a little bit, right? As, as I am, uh, and I'm, I'm doing stuff and I'm making this and you've made your film, was, was that kind of, uh, has that eased your frustration making the film? Has, you know, no, I, do you feel any more, you know, like you're making a difference or you feel alive or, you know? I am frustrated. Yeah. The reason I'm frustrated is because, again, a simple example, uh, even in this dull TV here, the people who are making this, all the people in this room are making this show. There's nobody in a suit out there authorizing it. There's nobody behind the scenes in other suits deciding when to intercede and edit. You're doing it on a grassroots level, which to me is the most exciting thing imaginable. In terms of frustration, I literally can't afford to put food on my table. I li for, in terms of making this film, I've nearly lost my home, lost my family, lost my fucking sanity. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. In terms of the people who authorize culture in this country, there are a whole bunch of people wearing suits who every single year get a massive annual fee 
and their job is to authorize culture. They don't do it. They don't facilitate culture. We've been treated appallingly so many times by cultural institutions in relation to Charlie Casanova. A film with no precedent whatsoever that should have been celebrated beyond measure has been dismissed so many times because I got the wrong mouth on me or I've said the wrong thing in some context or some occasion or because I'm not greasing the right palm. That's fundamentally wrong and that frustration has not abated. It's actually be, become intensified. Now the film board have stepped up for us magnificently mm -hmm. since then. Yeah, yeah. But that is in relation to the film. In relation to me putting my hand in my pocket and buying something for my kids, there's no context or connection whatsoever. It's a case of you were living in the equivalent of, of abject poverty yeah. and you were struggling and you were so, so fi you're so finished borrowing off different people that you go, I don't know who to borrow off anymore. So the film appears to be a magnificent success on one level and we have a big gala screening on the 2nd of May in the Lighthouse. And the money that will be spent on that and the money that will be spent on the advertising campaign will be money that I, w I couldn't imagine in my life right now. So when you go from writing 100 episodes of Fair City and the, the s small bit of security that that allows you, allows you to buy a home, it, actually the things that working class used to have as a birthright became mm -hmm. a privilege. But you buy a home or you try and build something for your kid's future. That's all gone. That's all wiped away. So the film itself becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You end up becoming a victim of the very thing that the film is trying to explore, yeah. which is how the classes are separated. I think if we, if we, I think the only way out of it is just to keep on highlighting and keep on pushing and keep on making it, you know, as real as possible and, until something breaks or something changes. Because I'm in a very similar position to you, and there's loads of guys out there, and there's loads of aspiring filmmakers. If you have any advice for you know, guys out there who are, you know, piss broke, unemployed, and they want to, you know, do film, they want to get in to do anything, what's your, what would be your advice? Well, it's funny because you're you're involved in rap, you're involved in hip hop. Mm -hmm. Film has not gone through a revolution. <coughs> Unfortunately, <coughs> it's gone through a reductionist conservatism. But music has gone through a profound revolution. And that revolution is based on the powers that be identifying that the very thing they used to reject, which is hip-hop, has in fact dominated music and has become a magnificent, anarchic revolution. So the great, great music that's been created at the moment is hip-hop. In television, there's some extraordinary television coming out of America, like genuinely profoundly remarkable television, and Britain, and yeah. other countries, France and stuff, but in Ireland, not yet. But the reality is that <coughs> the conservative ethos, the protective reductionist conservative ethos, is still very much in play in Ireland. And the only thing I would suggest, I'm not in a position to give, advise anybody, but I would suggest that we do not need permission anymore with the technology that exists. The technology exists now that you can buy for a few hundred quid that is better than equipment would have cost 50 grand 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago. There's no excuse anymore. Pick up your camera, get out there. The only problem is that too many people who I've seen who tried to make films, they tried to make imitative films. They tried to make their version of a Hollywood film. Replicate something else yeah. and, and Why so Why the on. fuck are you doing that? Yeah. Have the balls to find your singular vision. Have the balls to go, I'm gonna take my deepest secret, my deepest fear, my deepest fucking inadequacy, and I'm gonna examine that and see maybe if one person out there responds to the truth of that then we're going to have a revolution, then we're going to have cinema. It was a savage having you in, and I've used that word a couple of times, but it's just great having you in. Cheers. You know, we, we, we share a lot of similarities in how we think and how we just get up there and do it. And uh, I'm delighted for the success you've had. I'm delighted for the critique you've had from, you know, arseholes around the world and variety or whatever, because it's only really going to, for me, shine a light on, on what you're doing. So. Thank you, man. Thanks for Appreciate coming it. in, man. Thanks very much. Nice one.